Let me get the chat on here, see who's on here. Uh, live chat. I don't see any chat here at the moment. Folks, I hope you're all doing well. Um, I just don't see the chat. I see 11 people are on, but there is no chat. So if someone can write something in there so I know you're all here. That would be great. I'd really appreciate that. I'm pressing the chat. All messages are visible, it says, but I don't see no. Remember to go, okay. So if someone wants to say hello. Hey, Poppy, how are you? Good to see you. Hope you're doing well. Welcome, folks. If anybody else is on there, folks, just say hello. Joan, how are you? Good to see you. I guess there was a little bit of delayed reaction um, for the chat to come in, but good to see everybody. Victoria, how are you? Anna, how's it going? Dan, how are you? Welcome, everybody, folks. I hope you're all doing well. And welcome to Natalie, how are you? Good to see everybody, folks. Beautiful day here in Dublin today. 23 degrees uh, Celsius, around 73, 74 Fahrenheit. Very comfortable, lovely day. The problem with this chat here, you have to keep on pressing it on and off because it just goes off automatically. So folks, we'll, we'll get going right away. Good to see us all. Hope you're all doing well. And uh, welcome to my ancient Dublin tour. And we're gonna take in a lot of, uh, obviously, the oldest parts of the city, including uh, Marsh's Library, which we'll be going into in just a minute. The oldest library in all of uh, Ireland, dating back to 1707. And then we will make our way to St. Patrick's Cathedral, dating back to 1191. And then up to Christchurch Cathedral, the oldest working building in all of Dublin, dating back to around 1170. We'll take in then Wood Quay, the old Viking settlement here, the oldest Viking settlement here in Dublin from 8.40. And then uh, up to Fishamble Street, tell you a couple of stories. And this tour will be a little, maybe around an hour or so. I'm not sure if they're going to shut it down after an hour. Uh, I think I had it scheduled for an hour. Satyam, how are you? Good to see you. Welcome. Hope everybody's doing well, folks. Good to see you all. We'll start the tour. I'm going to make our way into Marsh's Library. As I said before, the oldest library in all of Ireland and it dates back to 1707 and it houses the important collections of European books and manuscripts from the 15th to the 18th centuries and uh, it was opened as the first public library in Ireland in 1707 and it gets its name from Archbishop Narcissus Marsh who established this beautiful uh, library as I say in 1707. How's the uh, the vision and everything, folks, can you see good? And how's the sound? Is everything all good? As nothing's coming to chat. Alison, how are you? Good to see you. So, this is the sign here from Marsh's Library. As I say, the oldest library in all of Ireland. A beautiful kept library. It's absolutely gorgeous. Now, there's two galleries in here. The first one, which we're going to go up to, is the. Uh, Anna, how are you? Great video and audio. Poppy says video is great, great stuff. Fantastic, folks. So you'll make your way up here to Marsh's Library. Now it's made up of two galleries here. The first gallery houses 10,000 books, which belonged to Edward Stingenfleet, a prominent English clergyman of the late 17th century. And uh, this collection is particularly strong in its coverage of history, law, politics, classical studies, and science. Now the founder of the library, Archbishop Narcissus Marsh, bought these books for £2,500 in 1707, which would have been an absolutely an enormous amount of money back at that time. And the gallery right here, both the galleries look exactly the same as they did from its inception over 300 years ago. How about that, folks? And there is Narcissus, Archbishop Narcissus Marsh, the man that established this beautiful library. Okay, so we we'll walk in. Now, there's a little partition before we go into the second gallery. But this is very unique, this gallery right here. So, if, uh, these are the oldest books that they have in the library, dating back, as I say, to the 15th century, which is quite extraordinary. Now, in Dublin, in uh, 1916, we had a, a war here. And there was bullet holes came through this window. And they ricocheted. Or they hit these, some of these books right here. You'll see the books and you'll see the evidence of the book. Oh, I'm not going to put my finger on it. 
but you see the evidence of the bullet holes here as well. Here's another one right here. And uh, just a credit to uh, the binding of books back in that day. Now some of them actually ricocheted off these books and landed over here in some of these other books as well, which is quite extraordinary. Now we're gonna go into the second gallery here and uh, there's a series of, of boots here, if you like. Is that right word? Boots. Where people would, over the centuries, would have taken books to read and sit down right here. But that all stopped after a period of time because these people would come into these boots and they'd have their bag with them. And many of the books were stolen. So what they ended up doing is they put people in these cages. Let me see. And I'll show you these cages right here. So the, what they do is because to stop all the theft, because it was, as I say, over a thousand books or something were stolen over the years. So they put them in these cages right here without their bags. So they have nothing in their possession as they went in. Where are we right now? Barbara, this is Marsh's Library. This is the oldest library in all of Ireland, established by Narcissus Marsh in 1707. Now, as I said, I was just saying, obviously, um, about the theft of some of these books when they were in these boots. They were then put into these cages and they had to leave their bags outside to avoid any um, theft. They were actually locked in these cages as well. There's the lock right there. <laughs> So that stopped any kind of uh, theft. Now today, you wouldn't find many people reading in here, actually very, very few, because this is more of a tourist attraction right now because of the age of the books. As I say, many of them are from the 15th century. But have a look at them. It's absolutely stunning, the display. And uh, as I say, it looks the exact same as it did from 300 years ago. No, Barbara, not in Trinity. Actually, I have a video of the, the Trinity Library, the long room in Trinity College. I have it on my YouTube channel, I think. I'm really sure I do. How are you doing there? Okay, we're going to make our way, folks, out of here because we've lots of places to show you. I never stay too long in one place. And we're going to make our way to... Excuse me. Sorry. And we're going to make our way to the... Um, the beautiful St. Patrick's Cathedral. So I hope you're all doing well, folks. The weather here in Dublin today is absolutely sensational. It really is terrific. And uh, as I said, it's about 23 degrees Celsius. This was already beautiful. Thank you, Natalie. I love the positivity. That's great. As I say, the chat now, folks, goes in and out. So I have to press the chat button all the time to uh, get back onto the chat. But yeah, lovely, fantastic day. The sun is shining. The weather's been absolutely beautiful here in Dublin and throughout Ireland for the last month or so. The average temperatures have been around 20, 20 to 23 degrees uh, Celsius, which is around, you know, 73, 74. Very, very comfortable. And uh, as I say, not like what you get in the United States at this time of the year or Canada, where it can be upwards of 90 degrees, in some cases even 100 degrees Fahrenheit. We don't get them kind of temperature temperatures. How fun. Thanks for taking us on this adventure with you. No problem, Barbara. Good, good stuff. I hope you're enjoying it. Here's an ancient graveyard here, folks. As I say, this is St. Patrick's Cathedral graveyard. There's only 500 graves in here, which is not a huge sum, but uh, they are all ancient. There, wouldn't have, there hasn't been a burial here for centuries at this particular graveyard. I want to show you a statue of a man coming up here. This is St. Patrick's Close, obviously named after St. Patrick, as is the cathedral, dedicated to Ireland's patron saint, St. Patrick. So let's just show you right we have here. I think we've got 21 people coming on now, so that's not too bad. Maybe we'll get a few others coming. Joan, how you doing? Good to see you. Hope the weather, the weather is beautiful, Joan. Absolutely stunning. It's amazing. As the chat goes away again. I hope it continues for the next... Oh, yeah. When I visit Carras Savine, great stuff. I was in Carras Savine last summer with Hazel. We did two, two tours in Carras Savine on the Ring of Kerry. Now, this right here is Benjamin Lee Guinness. He was the uh, grandson of the founder of the Guinness Brewery, 
Arthur Guinness, which was founded in 1759. But he was the owner himself around the 1830s, 40s and 50s. And this was his parish church right here at St. Patrick's Cathedral. So he would have been the wealthiest man in Ireland at that time. And he paid for all the renovations, all the remodels of this uh, particular church. And in night, I think it was in the 1850s, he paid £160,000 for the renovation of this, of this cathedral, which in today's money would probably be around 30 million euros, which is quite a considerable sum. Although he could have well afforded it, but still, the Guinness family, this was their parish church, and they very much were philanthropists of their time. I'm going to turn around here, lots of tour buses around here in St. Patrick's Close. You see a hop on, hop off bus, it's a big bus. Another hop on, hop off right there. But have a look at this. This is uh, Ireland's oldest school. So as I said before, folks, we're going to show you, the already showed you the oldest uh, library in Ireland. This is the oldest school. This is St. Patrick's Cathedral Choir School, and it dates back to 1432. It's still going strong as a school today. It's a non-denominational school, so anybody of any religion can come here, although it is very difficult to get into because it's of very high educational standards. Now, we're going to make our way in, as I say, folks, to St. Patrick's Cathedral, which uh, dates to 1191. Here's the coat of arms of St. Patrick's Cathedral, and you'll see, of course, St. Patrick right here. St. Patrick, the patron saint of Ireland. So this is dedicated to them. Now, it dates back to 1191. It was established by Archbishop uh, John Common. And it is the National Cathedral of Ireland. It's also the largest cathedral as well. Now, have a look at the first spot I'm going to show you right here. This is the baptism. This originates, this is the oldest part of the building. And it dates back to 1191, this particular room right here at the baptistry and the old baptistry as you can see right there they still baptize babies to this very day in that baptismal right there floors as you see are the original floors from way back in the 12th century it's quite extraordinary it really is let me put the chat back on because uh, as i say it goes in and out natty likes it anyway at least we got one person that likes it <laughs> okay we move our move inside folks this is a stunning cathedral, and uh, it's full of tourists now. I was here a little earlier talking to the people that run the uh, cathedral here, and it was tons of people. It's actually quieting down right now, but it really is stunning. Lots and lots of statues in here as well. I'm going to bring you up here to the, um, the, the ladies' chapel, as it's called. I hope it's not cornered off. I just saw some rope there. Please don't be cornered off. No, it's not. So check it out, folks. The beautiful stained glass windows here. It is cornered off. I can't believe it. And let me go over here for a minute. I'm going to show you the Lady Chapel from a different, uh, from a different angle because uh, they've got tape across it, so I can't get up close. And the, the Lady Chapel, this was added. I guess there's the choir is about to start, or maybe there's a private tour in the Lady Chapel, as you can see right here. Now, this was uh, added. Um, the floor tiles are amazing. Aren't they absolutely spectacular? Supposedly, there's like 60,000 tiles here in 60 different styles. It really is incredible. And uh, the Lady Chapel was added here in 1270 and was used by the, the Huguenots from 1666 to 1816. And the Huguenots were from France, from, uh, I believe, uh, Burgundy or Brittany. And they were persecuted, they were French Calvinists and they were persecuted by the French government and many of them arrived to Great Britain and Ireland during the 1600s. So they used this as their chapel. It was restored here in 2013 and uh, offers a, 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 a glimpse of its original colours and uh, it really is spectacular and you'll see obviously where the choir, one of the greatest choirs, not in just in Ireland but one of the world's greatest choirs is here, right here at St. Patrick's Cathedral. And you see their seating facilities right there. And uh, they practice every night. It's such a huge choir that different uh, members of the choir will practice here every single evening around 5.30. And uh, if you're ever in Dublin and you ever come into St. Patrick's Cathedral, you can actually listen to those choir members. The church closes at five o'clock, but if you stick around and don't leave at five o'clock, 
then you can listen to the choir at 5.30. You just have to ask them. And uh, most of the time, they'll have no problem. Now, there's two services here in the cathedral each day. Matinee's in the morning and evening song, as I say, in the evening. And uh, I want to show you this as well. This is the tree of remembrance right here at the chapel. And uh, I can't believe the time's flying by. 15 minutes already. The tree of remembrance allows visitors to remember anyone in their lives affected by conflict. And the regimental colors embody the saying, old side soldiers do not die, they simply fade away, as these flags slowly fade away over time. And uh, so anybody that has lost a loved one, doesn't matter, in conflict or any other way, can actually uh, post a flag here uh, and write the name of the person, their loved one. As I say, this is the tree of remembrance. Now, have a look at this. This is known as the reconciliation door right here. Um, now, this was obviously a different location once upon a time, but it's on display here. And let me tell you the story, folks. I've got a story. Anybody want to hear a story? Give me a, give me a love heart if you want to hear a story, folks. Okay, Natalie wants to hear a story. Beautiful tiles, Austin, yes. I'm not getting much chat in here, folks. I don't know. Maybe everybody's abandoned me. I'm not sure. So, okay, Poppy, great stuff. Poppy always says Natalie. Okay, great stuff. So this is uh, known as the Door of Reconciliation. Um, now, the medieval cathedral here played a central role in many historic events. Now, this event happened in 1492. A feud between the butlers of Ormond and the Fitzgeralds of Kildare led to the families. Now, they, these two families were fighting for centuries. And uh, back then in 1492, they both were seeking refuge here in the cathedral. And after arguing through this chapel house door, which was obviously located in a different location within the cathedral, uh, Gerald Fitzgerald thrust his arm through a hole in the door, this hole as you can see right here, as an offer of peace. And the butlers accepted and peace was made, giving rise to the phrase, to chant your arm. There you go, folks. No more fighting between the two families, which is fantastic. So there is an event going on here. I can see the archbishops all there. They're probably wondering, what, what's this guy doing? Uh, it's the cathedral, like most cathedrals are known. Oh, sorry, folks. Sorry, 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 sorry. Give me a check. I'm out there uh, messing up with my... Give me a mo moment, folks, please. I can't believe I did that. I knocked my own. Oh, there we go. There we go. Thank you. I hit the wire. I've got uh, I got a microphone on. So yeah, most of these cathedrals are known for their beautiful um, stained glass windows. I know the sun's shining through that. You can't see it too well. Uh, now many of the stained glass windows here uh, date from the late 18 and the early 1900s. A number of different artists, companies were involved, which is why each window looks so different. How about that one there? It's beautiful. Now on display here, folks, is this man, and you'll probably know him, and his name is Jonathan Swift. You may know him better as a writer with such great classics as Gulliver's Travels and A Modest Proposal, just to mention a few. Well, he was the dean here. The person looking after this cathedral would be, would, back in the day would have been a dean or a senior clerk. And from 1713, right up until his death in 1745, the dean of St. Patrick's Cathedral right here was none other than Jonathan Swift. And here he is, here's his pulpit right here. Now, he is also buried right here in the cathedral. And here is his resting place right here, under these tiles with his companion, Stella, Stella Johnson. They weren't lovers, they were just companions. And uh, there actually has uh, the graves of Swift and Stella, and they also have a reenactment or whatever of what they may have looked like today if they were alive, or, or what they would have looked like, sorry, back then. Now, Jonathan Swift lived a, a very long life. He lived till he was 78 years old at a time during them early 1700s and mid 1700s where Dublin people, their average age 
of death was 36 years old. There was extreme poverty at that time. Jonathan Swift was great. He used to try and give them uh, positivity and energy and so forth with his sermons here, trying to uh, better their lives and what have you. But they say the reason why Jonathan Swift lived so well was because he used to exercise every day and he used to bathe every day as well. So if there was a gym around back then, he would have been in it every day. Although, of course, there wasn't a gym. So he would have done his own exercises, push-ups and press-ups and what have you. And a very fit man. And as I say, he was a clean freak, if you like, too. So he uh, bathed, they say, three times a day. Okay, we've plenty of other places to see. As I say, folks, we've shown you the tiles earlier. They're absolutely stunning. They were beautiful. Diane, how are you doing? Victoria, how are you? I get a love heart. Yeah, they're absolutely stunning, the tiles here, folks. This place, over 600,000 or more. Hi, Laura, how are you? There's Laura, that's the lady that runs the place here. Laura, great stuff, Laura. All right, guys, say hello, everybody. Say hello to the world. <laughs> All right, see you later. Sorry. See you later. Okay, we make our, they always let me go in there to live stream. They're really cool. Amazing tiles, says Joan, yeah? I got a feeling that the uh, chat is delayed here. Now we're gonna make our way, folks, because I want to give you a view of this beautiful cathedral uh, from a different angle, because it really is stunning, not only from the inside, but also from the outside. Now, I mentioned earlier that St. Patrick's Cathedral was dedicated, obviously, to Ireland's patron saint, St. Patrick, who we celebrate each year on the March the 17th, which is the day of his death, the date of his death, and uh, huge celebrations here in Dublin, an amazing festival at that time as well, each 17th of March. You may have been on my... Uh, St. Patrick's Day parade tour, which I've done, done, done on Hago for the last few years. Huge success, people love them. These are Viking need needles that you see right here. They were actually found when they were widened this street, a couple of, maybe over a century, a couple of centuries ago. They found them under, underground here. Now this is St. Patrick's Park that we're going into right now. Now it's believed that St. Patrick baptized the Irish pagans, as they were known back then, they were pagans. And he baptized them into Christianity. Right here in this park, right at this very, very spot, or very close to this spot, as it says right here, I don't know if you can read it. Near here is the reputed site of the well where St. Patrick baptized many of the local inhabitants in the fifth century. So he used water from the river Poddle, which today runs underneath this part of the city. And uh, they actually built a wooden church for him back at that time as well. And uh, if you see in the, in the distance right there, can you please show outside shot? Of, I'm going to do that, Tina. I'm going to do that. That's why I'm bringing you into the park. But I'm going to bring you to the very best possible site to show you the cathedral from the outside. But you'll see a bell in the, in the, in the just a little bit up from where I'm walking, and that is St. Patrick's Bell. And this is a replica of what the bell would have looked like, what St. Patrick used to call on his congregation for prayers. As I say, way back in the fifth century. It's quite incredible. Now, that obviously is not the original. The original supposedly is in the History Museum here in Dublin. But there's some disputes over whether that's the well, that's the right one or not, because a lot of historians say that dates back to the 8th century, not the 5th century. So here's the beautiful St. Patrick's Cathedral from a different angle. And this is quite beautiful. Might you take us to uh, Kilmainham Jail? I may do that, Barbara. I'm really, really, really busy. I get, this is the first time in a month or more that I've done a live stream tour because I've been so busy with in-person tours, walking tours. It's just really, really, really busy. As I say, this is the National Cathedral of Ireland and it is an Anglican cathedral. And uh, it's supposedly the tallest, although there's some disputes over that because there's another 
Cathedral in Cove in County Cork, St. Coleman's, which you may have seen on my tours of Cove in County Cork, and they say they have the highest steeple in Ireland. But St. Patrick's Cathedral claims they are the highest. It really is a spectacular uh, building, as you can see. I wonder if you think so yourselves. You can let me know in the chat. But it is spectacular. I'll show you some other views of the cathedral from different angles a little later on. Now, this is St. Patrick's Park, as I said before, and this is, uh, was set up by the Guinness family, Lord Ivy, uh, by the Guinness Trust, or the Ivy Trust, if you like. And uh, if you see these red brick buildings right in front of me, believe it or not, they stretch way, way, way back, and there are 1,600 units of these red brick buildings that you see right here. They're known as the Ivy Trust buildings, or the Guinness Trust buildings, if you like. Now, these were built in the 1880s, and they were built as affordable housing for the poor people of Dublin, and they still remain affordable housing for the poor people of Dublin to this very day. And the people that live in these, the working class people of Dublin, they pay 124 euros per week, making it less than 500 euros per month for these beautiful two bedroom apartments, flats as we call them, here in the Ireland and the UK. They really are lovely. And it stretches all the way back. Now they're not all here at this one location. There's some uh, on a different part of Dublin, just probably three minute walk from here. But the most of them are right here. As I say, this stretches all the way up towards uh, Christchurch Cathedral, these Ivy Trust buildings. Really is magnificent. There also is the largest homeless shelter in all of Ireland, located right here as well, which is fabulous. And this building right here that you see, also set up by the Guinness Trust, the Ivy Trust, and that is Liberty College today, but this originally was a playground, if you like, for the uh, poor people of Dublin, the poor children of Dublin, where they come here to learn all about arts and crafts and what have you. It was set up in uh, 1913 at this location, originally at another location from 1907 to 1913, and uh, it was disbanded in 1974. But this was the largest creche, if you like, or kindergarten, in the whole entire world at one time. It is now, as I say, a college called Liberty College as it was closed down as a creche, as its kindergarten in 1974. So it was great for the poor people of this area, known as the Liberties, here in Dublin. Here's another view of Christchurch Cathedral from a different angle. How's that, folks? Okay, I'm getting some... I was thinking the same thing, John. Okay, I missed that. Uh, I read Dublin has the largest collection of Viking and artefacts. Yes, it does. We're going to take you down to Viking Dublin now in just a minute. This is great that you're busy. Okay, yes. Thank you. Um, John. I read Dublin has the largest collection of Viking artefacts. More artefacts have been found there than any other place. I'm going to tell you the story about that, Diane, in just a little bit. But here's another view of the beautiful St. Patrick's Cathedral before we make our way down to just about 300 metres away, we have another cathedral, which is quite extraordinary that you have two cathedrals, more or less, side by side here in Dublin City. I'm not sure if there's other places across the world that have two cathedrals so close to one another. Now, this area of Dublin that we're walking in right now, as I say, is the oldest part of Dublin, and it's known as the Liberties. Now, the Liberties is a, a big Dublin community, and uh, it takes in about seven kilometers. Most of the liberties would be across the road there and beyond. And uh, it has two cathedrals, ancient, other ancient churches. There's uh, open air markets. There's four whiskey distilleries. And there is, of course, the Guinness Storehouse, the Guinness Brewery, and also the Guinness Storehouse, the Guinness Storehouse is Ireland's, which shows you how they brewed Guinness. And it is the number one tourist attraction in all of Ireland. I believe there was 2.4 million people visited the Guinness Storehouse in 2019. So it really is 
fabulous place, but the people that live here in the Liberties are more like working class people and uh, they consider themselves to be the real dubs. Dubs, as in Dublin, because they're from the inner city and they're from the oldest place in all of uh, Dublin. I'm going to run here for a minute because I want to catch this light, the screen light. If I miss it, I'll be waiting four or five minutes for the next one. So we've made it. So this is all part of these Ivy Trust buildings, as I mentioned earlier, folks. As I say, there's 1,600 units all told. So it's quite extraordinary. And this is some of the chat, I think. Uh, excellent. The last one was excellent from Barbara. Okay, great. So as I say, we're going to make our way up here, folks, to another cathedral. And this cathedral is Christchurch Cathedral. You might see it in the background right there. Or ahead of you. Sorry, not in the background, but ahead of you. And... Uh, this is the oldest working building in all of Dublin. Now, originally, it was founded by the Vikings when there was, and this is in the year around 10, <coughs> 1028 to 1030 or so, and it was a wooden structure. And it was built on high ground overlooking the Viking settlement of Wood Quay here in Dublin. Then the Normans in around the year 1170, they came and defeated the Vikings and they rebuilt this cathedral in stone under Richard de Clare, who was a Norman warlord. He's otherwise known as Strongbow. And Strongbow's tomb yeah. lies in rest right here in the cathedral. It's a magnificent building and this today, as I say, folks, is the oldest building in all of Dublin, dating back to 1170. It's in the English Gothic style, Romanesque style, if you like. And uh, originally, now these cathedrals that I've just shown you, folks, today, they're both Anglican cathedrals of the Protestant faith, but they weren't always Anglican cathedrals. These were Catholic cathedrals when they were first built and uh, when they were first built in the 12th century. But that all changed in the year 1538. So this cathedral right here was run by Archbishop Lawrence O'Toole. Remember that name? In the 12th century, with its inception, it was, it was uh, run by Archbishop Lawrence O'Toole, who later became a saint. And that's real important for a story I'm gonna tell you in a little bit later, right? So it all changed in 1538. All of Great Britain at that time were Catholics all of Ireland was Catholic, so all the churches were Catholic in Britain and Ireland. It all changed in 1538 when Henry VIII, the ruler of all Great Britain and Ireland, approached the Pope for annulment or for a divorce, for permission to divorce his wife, Catherine of Oregon. But the Pope refused him permission. So with that, Henry VIII decided to help with the Pope, I'm gonna start my own religion. So he started his own religion, and that religion was the Anglican religion. So what happened was all of Great Britain, that used to be Catholic, and Henry VIII used to be Catholic himself. They all became Anglicans, and from that, all the Protestant faith, faith-based uh, religions were formed. And still to this day, it's an Anglican church. So all the churches throughout Ireland, throughout Great Britain, became Anglican or Protestant churches. So today the modern churches in Ireland are all Catholic because it's a very Catholic country. But all the original buildings that are Anglican or Protestant, that are really old, at one time were Catholic. Now remember I told you that uh, about Archbishop Lawrence O'Toole, who was the Archbishop here. And I said, remember that now. There's no chat coming in, so I'm not sure if people are attempting to put in a chat or if I'm just not seeing the latest chat. Or maybe you're just listening and there is no chat. I don't know. So Archbishop Lawrence O'Toole, his, uh, his heart was on display here in this cathedral for centuries, centuries and centuries and centuries. And in 2012, it was stolen. 
It was on display here and it was stolen. In 2018, the man that stole, there's still no chat, so I'm not sure if anybody is chatting or not. Anyway, just say hello, folks, if you're still on there. I'm getting worried that people have abandoned ship or they're not on. So if you can just say hello. Anyway, so in 2012, Archbishop Lawrence O'Toole, his... Okay, you said, okay, sat on. thanks a lot. Thanks, Poppy, still here, enjoying the story. So great stuff, thank you so much. So his heart was stolen in 2012. And the man that stole it called the guards, which is the Irish police. So he called the authorities to say, I have Lawrence O'Toole's heart. And uh, he told them where to find it. He said he's going to put it somewhere and give him a chance to, to pick it up. But the police, the guards, asked this man, why are you giving this back after having it for six years? And he said, I've had nothing but tragedy in my life ever since I stole it. My wife died, my parents died, my sister died. Everything that could go possibly go wrong has gone wrong in my life. That's why I'm returning it. I went for a story. So folks, don't ever steal a heart. Now, I don't mean that literally. I mean the actual heart itself. <laughs> All righty then. Oh, what did I just do? It's me too. Just listen, okay. Thank you, Anna. Anna Virtual Tours. Good to see you. Listen, great stuff, folks. So in here, folks, in this cathedral, you have the oldest secular carvings of any cathedral in, or any church anywhere in the world. There is also the largest cathedral crypt within this cathedral. Uh, it's the largest cathedral crypt in either Great Britain or Ireland. And uh, if you ever come on a tour here, you're allowed to go down into the crypt. And there's some good stories about the crypt. On display in the crypt is a cat and a rat. And how did they get there? Well, in 1850, the uh, organist was about to play the organ and he put his foot on the petal and it was stuck. So he went around the back and he seen stuck in the pipes was a cat and a rat and they were dead. And their mummified remains are here on display in the cathedral crypt. And they are affectionately known as, you guessed it folks, Tom and Jerry. And they even get a mention in James Joyce's book, Finnegan's Wake. Now, across over here, obviously, this at one time would have been part of Christ Church Cathedral. But you'll see an archway right here that leads over to what is one of the great museums here in Dublin. And that is the Dublinia Museum, which tells the story of medieval Dublin and the Vikings. So where I am right here, folks, is Viking Dublin. Someone asked a little earlier about the Vikings. Well, I'm going to bring you down exactly to their very first settlement here in Dublin. But this museum is a first class museum, tells the story of the Vikings and the Celts and the Normans, just goes way, way back in history and so forth. Absolutely fabulous from museum. Joan, I remember that crypt, so interesting. There you go, great stuff. So Joan's been here. Um, now in this museum, you'll find all kinds of artifacts also from the Vikings. You'll f see Viking ships and everything else as well, and it tells the story of the Vikings here in Dublin. Now, as I mentioned before, before this church, the Christ Church Cathedral was built in stone. It originally was a wooden structure built on high ground overlooking the oldest Viking settlement in here in Dublin, which was in eight, the year 840, nearly 1200 years ago. So they sailed up here to Wood Quay on the River Liffey in that year. And this was their settlement right here. Behind the church was their settlement known as Wood Quay. And where there's an ugly ass building today called the Dublin City Council building. And much to the disgust of the Dublin people and not just Dublin people, but Irish people in general and the mainstream population. Because in the 1970s, early 1970s, there was a huge archaeological dig going on here and at this particular site and they were finding all kinds of Viking artifacts. They were finding hundreds, if not thousands of Viking homes, hundreds of Viking ships, all kinds of metalworks and 
all kinds of uh, artifacts, as I say, from the Vikings. There was protests every weekend, huge protests throughout Dublin City to stop the Irish government from building this building on the sacred site of the Vikings. Here's some of the Viking artifacts you see on the streets here in Dublin. You can see right there, just some of them. Uh, they're around all over the place. Anyway, the government obviously, they got their way in the end. It took them 15 years, but in 1985, they built this ugly building right here on the sacred site of the Vikings. Such a shame. Now, no private entity would ever have had an opportunity to be able to do that. But I guess if you're the government, here's some more folks. Artifacts on the Vikings. Now we're making our way down to the River Liffey here. And I'm gonna show you where the Vikings first uh, came to Dublin or rode up the River Liffey. And uh, this is one of the bridges right here, known as the O'Donovan Rossa Bridge, named after an Irish rebel one of 21 bridges to run over the city of Dublin. I'm going to run across the road, folks, because I've got a green light. If I miss it, I'll wait five minutes for another one. So here you got Wood Key here, folks. Wood Key. So, yeah, named after Donovan Rossa. He was a, a rebel, part of the Irish Republican Brotherhood. And in the background, you'll see the beautiful dome building right there of the four courts here in Dublin, designed in around 1783 by James Gandon, probably the greatest architect to ever be here in Dublin, because some of the most iconic buildings are attributed to this man in Dublin. This is Wood Key, so it's right here at this bridge that the Vikings rode up to and made their settlement behind that building right there, Wood Key. So uh, yeah, James Gandon, he designed the King's Inn, O'Connell Bridge, the old Irish Parliament, well, he was part of that. I'm missing some uh, chat right there. What's this cathedral called? This is not a cathedral, this is the Four Courts. That is the Four Courts. The cathedral we just left was Christ Church Cathedral. That is the Four Courts of Dublin. Circuit Court, the Superior Court, what's Supreme Court, the Divorce Court, Four Courts and all. Also, James Gannon designed probably the most fabulous building in all of Dublin, the Custom House. Absolutely stunning. You may have seen that building on my uh, tour of the River Liffey, featuring uh, Temple Bar. The bridge you see down here further is the Henry Grattan Bridge, named after one of the most beloved olden day politicians, Henry Grattan, who fought for Irish freedom, Irish civil rights, economic rights for the poor Irish people of the day. And, uh, he was part of the old Irish Parliament here in Dublin, fighting for Irish causes, politically. He was so popular that the, that the Irish people didn't call the Irish Parliament the Irish Parliament. They called it Grattan's Parliament. As I say, he was fighting for the people. I'm crossing the road here, folks, because there's a break in the traffic. If I don't do it now, it could be waiting a little while. Because now we're going to make our way onto Fishamble Street. And Fishamble Street, as I mentioned earlier, folks, we are in the oldest part of Dublin. This is ancient Dublin. And Fishamble Street is the oldest street in Dublin. It's named because it was once upon a time, in medieval times, there was a fish market on this street. But there was also an open-air meat market, or an open-air slaughterhouse, if you like, which was known as a shambles back then, hence the name Fishamble. Fishamble Street. Gotta go. Thanks, Dave. Great tour. We'll watch the rest later. Thank you, Anna. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for coming on. Really appreciate that. So, Fishamble Street, as I said before, folks, the oldest street in Dublin is what we're on right now, right adjacent to uh, Christchurch Cathedral. If you see this house here in the corner, this is number 26 Fishamble Street, and this is the oldest continuously lived in house in all of Dublin and uh, members of the same family have lived in this particular house since 1720 the Casey family right there number 26 the one in the corner and uh, now it's not the oldest house in Dublin it's the oldest continuously lived in house dates back to 1720 okay let's move on this street is also famous 
for another occasion, a great event, and you may have heard of it, Handel's Messiah. So have a look at the name of this particular hotel right here. It's called Handel's Hotel. So the first recital of Handel's Messiah, Alleluia, took place right here when this was a musical on the 13th of April, 1742. As it says right here, George Frederick Handel, the first performance of the Messiah took place here at the Music Hall, Fish Amble Street, April 13th, 1742. Now performing that day with George Frederick Handel was none other than the choirs of both St. Patrick's Cathedral and Christ Church Cathedral, which you've seen both today. They are two of the great choirs of the world. I'm not just saying that because I'm from Dublin, but they are exceptional choirs. Now folks, if you've ever been on my ancient Dublin tour before, which I did, this was the tour I did most than any other tour on Hegel. So you've probably heard this story before if you've been on this tour. I know Poppy's heard it before. And I'm sure some of the other guys have as well. Joan probably has as well, and Natalie. So anybody up for a story, folks? Give me a thumbs up if you want to hear a story. There's very much delayed reaction from the... Uh... It's always worth hearing again, Poppy. There you go. Thank you, Poppy. Poppy's the only one who wants to hear a story. Anybody else want to hear one? Natalie says yes. Joan wants to hear it. So only the people that heard it before want to hear it again. Anybody else, folks? You need to get excited. Get excited. So here goes, folks. The story is about this pub right here. It's called Darky Kelly's. Now this, thank you, Satyam. This was not always a pub. This was a brothel in the 1700s, around the early to mid 19th, or 1700s. It was a brothel, which was run by Madame Darky Kelly. And this was the biggest brothel in all of Dublin. It was, uh, she had a hundred prostitutes on the payroll, and this was the go-to place among the elites of Dublin. One, the go-to place, because she had the most beautiful prostitutes and what have you, and so forth. Now, Darkie Kelly made a big mistake. She had a relationship with the Dublin sheriff at the time, and his name was Simon Luttrell, and he was the most powerful man in Dublin at the time. But this was also a man that you didn't want to have a falling out with, or you didn't want to mess with. And unfortunately for Darky Kelly, she had a falling out with this man. And with that, she, he accused Darky Kelly of being a witch and of performing witchcraft. Of which, of which, do you get it? No pun intended. Of which she was totally innocent. She was not a witch and she never performed witchcraft. But despite that, she was partially hung and burnt at the stake for something that she was innocent of. Now, the story doesn't end there. Because a few days before her execution, there was a very, very well-known Dublin businessman that was missing, and no one knew where he was. So after her execution, they decided, the day after, they decided to come into this brothel right here, and uh, they lifted up the floorboards. Underneath the floorboards was this, this very, very well-known Dublin businessman, and he was dead along with six other men under the floorboards, all dead, making Darkie Kelly Ireland's first ever serial killer. So I guess she wasn't that innocent after all. Now, you may know this place from the music events that I do on Sunday evenings. I mostly did them on Sunday evenings with Hago right here because this is the music bar of the year in Dublin for 2019 and 2022 and it is absolutely fabulous traditional Irish music now I'm gonna go do with this on all intentions to do it I haven't posted it yet to do a music night again in Darkie Kelly's right here to listen to the Irish Celts at um, around 7 15 Irish time this coming Sunday I haven't posted it yet I will do that I hope you're excited about that folks Keolog is crack music and fun crack in the Irish language means fun no relation to that dangerous drug C-R-A-I-C, crack means fun. So Kjol August crack, music and fun. Kjol is the word for music. 
The most used word in the Irish language is August, which means and. So Kjol, August crack, music and fun. Hope you can join me this Sunday. Yes, indeed, Satyam says crack, Sunday crack. Awesome. Great stuff. We're hearing thumbs up, so folks will do that. Let's move on. Already 50 minutes in. Where does the time go, folks? I'm coming up to the corner here of Fishamble Street and Lord Edward Street and Christchurch Place. Once again, you see Christchurch. We did a circle right there, or a square, if you like. So we're back onto Christchurch Cathedral right there again. But uh, this street right here, Lord Edward Street, is named after Lord Edward Fitzgerald. He was a rebel leader, and he was part of the 1798 rebellion, one of the many rebellions we had against the British Empire. And. Uh, we lost every single one of them, including the 1798 Rebellion. And this street, is say Lord Edward Street, is named after one of the leaders of that. Wolf Town and Lord Edward Fitzgerald were the two leaders of that uh, rebellion. Now, he happened to be... Uh, he happened to be injured. I've got ladies behind me, they're real loud. I'm sure you can hear them when I'm trying to tell my story here. But anyway, Lord Edward Fitzgerald, he... Um, he was injured during the 1798 Rebellion and uh, he died from his injuries a few days later. But well, if he hadn't died from his injuries, he would have been executed as they always executed the leaders of these rebellions at that time. This pub right here, the Lord Edward, is named after him. You see it right here. And why is this named the Lord Edward? Because this is where he lived. He lived upstairs above and that's a statue right there. There's this portrait, if you like, right there, or a painting of him, Lord Edward Fitzgerald. He was from a very prominent family. His father was Lord Leinster, James Fitzgerald. He was one of 15 children. Lord Leinster, he owned Leinster House, which today is the place where the Irish government resides, in Dáil Éireann, Assembly of Ireland, the Irish Parliament, the Irish government. Anybody remember this place here, folks? From the Hago days? So this is Leo... Bur no, go ahead there. No problem. No problem. Thank you. I very much appreciate you. Thank you. This is Leo Burdocks. This is the most famous and the oldest fish and chip shop here in Dublin. We don't even call them fish and chip shops. We call them chippers. And uh, it dates back to 1913. Fish and chips. There you go, Satyam. Of course I remember, says Pop Poppy. Yes, indeed. So this is, it keeps on fading the chat, so I have to keep on pressing this button all the time to see it. Yes, Joan remembers it as well. So this place is so famous. This fish and chip shop, as I say, the oldest fish and chip shop in Dublin, established in 1913. That celebrities that come to Dublin, all your great musicians of the world, all your Hollywood actors and uh, other real famous people, have come here on numerous occasions, and this is why they have their own Wall of Fame. So let's have a look at the Wall of Fame, see who's been here. You two, obviously, they're Irish. Now, some of these celebrities are Irish, and you wouldn't know them, but many of them are from uh, the US, Canada, and where have you. You got Sandra Bullock, the great uh, American actress. LL Cool J. Bruce Springsteen and his band, he was actually here just about three or four weeks ago. He had three sold out shows. I actually asked these guys in here, who's the most frequent visitor of all the celebrities? And they said it was Bruce Springsteen himself. He puts it down his bags at the uh, Shelburne Hotel or the Marion Hotel, where, wherever he stays. And uh, immediately he makes his way here. And he stands in line. This place, obviously at this time of night, it's not so busy, but during the afternoon, it's very busy. And um, he would join the queue. He wouldn't skip the line. He would join the, the line, or the queue as we call it here. Just like everybody else, no airs or graces about him. He'll stand in line and talk to the locals, or whoever's in line with him. He refuses to go to the top of the queue because he's a celebrity. Yeah, fair play to him. Sorry there. You got Serena Williams, Venus Williams, all the real fame. Celebrities, see all the celebrities that come here. The Wall of Fame. Get excited. Thank you. Uh, I see Anya. You too. I love you too, Natalie. Yeah, they're great. Fantastic. Anya, yeah, Anya. It's fantastic. 
Some of them are Irish celebrities, you wouldn't know them. Cuba Gooding Jr. Ray Charles. Obviously, he's deceased now. You can see uh, lots of them. Uh, William Shatner. Captain Kirk. He's been here as well. Pretty cool, huh? Maybe our favorite celebrities there. Here, while we've got a minute, folks, I'm going to show you another. Um, I'm going to show you another view of Christ Church Cathedral from a different angle. Gilbert O'Sullivan, yeah, lovely. Uh, so here's another look at the sun's in my eyes. This is a shame. Here's another look at Christ Church Cathedral from a different angle, although the sun is shining down on the building. Uh, I should have wore sunglasses today myself. I can hardly see it. But you can see it right there, folks. I'll tell you what, because we have a little bit of time, now this may shut, this may shut, sorry, it may shut out on me, uh, shut off on me, I should say, um, in about four minutes. I'm not sure. Because I did schedule, I think, for an hour. If it does, thank you so much for coming on the show today, folks. I really appreciate it. But I'm bringing you down to Dublin Castle in case it doesn't shut off on me. And uh, please, if you haven't already, please subscribe to my channel. I uh, appreciate that. If you wish to buy me a coffee, there's a link there as well. Or you could also PayPal, pay by PayPal if you want, if you wish. Up to yourselves, folks. It's great to uh, see you all again on this platform. And uh, thank you so much for all coming in. Bought a cup of coffee for you. Hope you'll see them. Thanks very much, Barbara. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joan. Thanks, Natalie. Yeah. I tell you, the weather helped as well. It was absolutely sensational. Uh, Natalie, it was beautiful, beautiful weather. Um, yeah, if you wish, folks, please uh, subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. I'm sure probably most of you that are on here already have. But uh, if you haven't, please do so. I have, I think, like 720 subscribers but i need to get that to that magic 1000 um also if you go to my youtube channel i got a bunch of i think i got 115 different uh, videos on it i only have about four or five maybe six from the hago days i forgot to I, I didn't have time to download all of them so i'm gonna just redo them all on youtube instead of giving you the recordings of them because i, I just don't have them i only have a few and I think I've already posted them all. That's uh, City Hall right here, folks. It was built between 1765 and 1775. Beautiful building, spectacular inside. Lovely chandeliers and beautiful paintings and what have you. It's also a big wedding venue as well today. This is where we're approaching now. It's known as the State Apartments and this of Dublin Castle. So this is one of the many entrances, There's probably about six different entrances into Dublin Castle. This is one of them, and it brings you into the state apartments. If the people that run this place see me live stream, they're going to come over and try and stop me. But they're not here because it's closed, I think, five o'clock. So this is the beautiful state apartments here at uh, Dublin, full luxurious rooms. Really is stunning. I think we're still on, people are still on, but really is stunning. So this is the, uh, the site of every single inauguration of every Irish president it takes place right here at St. Patrick's Hall within this building. It's also where all the state dinners take place. Um, many, many dignitaries have been here over the years. Thank you, Sue. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for this brilliant tour. I was last. Oh, I missed it. Missed it. Missed it. I have to click it on again. I was last in Dublin many years ago, so it's been grand to see it all again. Join the history. Thanks, Sue. Thanks, Alison. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, so, as I say, this, this might cut off me in about 15 seconds, we'll see. But it may stay on, I'm not sure. Um, but in here is St. Patrick's Hall, where all the dignitaries come for state dinners. John F. Kennedy was here in 1963, June of 1963, just five months before his assassination for a state dinner. Benjamin Franklin was here in the late uh, 1700s also. 
as I say, this dates back to the late 1600s, early 1700s, this building. So you've had many, many people over the years. Princess Grace of Monaco was also here. Not sure if you, uh, I missed that again. It keeps on fading. So the chatting is completely different than it is in Hagel. Not sure if you would, uh, I missed it, sorry. Not sure if I would feel comfortable or not with these ideas, but the historical prison or synagogue might be big draws for virtual tours. Got to run. Love your energy. Thanks so much, Barbara. Yes, good idea. I'll try and do something like that if I can find some time. I'd say it might be the fall or, or as we call it, the autumn. I'll buy you a Tim, Timmy's layer. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Are you related to Sarah Cavan? No relation, Tina. Um, Cavan is a big name in Ireland. It's probably about the 20th, 25th biggest name in Ireland, let's say. Murphy being the biggest. And O'Sullivan, I think, is the second biggest. Or Kelly. Byrne, another big name. O'Brien, another huge name. All right, folks, I'll leave you here at the State Apartments here at the beautiful Dublin Castle. Thank you so much for coming. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. And uh, we'll see you Sunday. I haven't posted it yet, but check my YouTube channel. Um, and you will see I will post a tour. I'm going to do probably a tour next week. I'm hoping maybe next week or the week after to go back to the beautiful Parish Court Gardens. Thank you, Poppy. <laughs> Thank you so much. So many great stories. Thank you. Thanks, Satyan. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, everybody. Really appreciate it. Appreciate all your kind words. So, um, yeah, as I say, Darky Kelly's for some music. Keolog is cracked this Sunday. And maybe not ne next week, because I'm busy all next week doing some bus tours. I've also got a Hago hey coming next, next week. I th I'm meeting her, I think, next Wednesday. Um, and you probably all know her, Patty, Patty Paretta from Toronto. And she's coming here for, I think, a week's holiday to Ireland. And I'll be meeting her in Dublin next Wednesday. So this day next week, I'll be meeting Paddy. And we'll have some drinks and we'll give her a tour. This will be great. Murphy, Sullivan and Kelly, all in my family today. There you go, Joan. And O'Neill, of course. O'Neill's a big name too. Very big Irish name. Um, so, folks, we'll see us, uh, as I say, in a couple of weeks, I'll, I'll, I'll probably try and start doing some more tours. Real, real busy at the moment. Uh, I'll try and maybe uh, try and fit in some evening tours uh, down the line. So, folks, that's all I got for you. So, slán lát agus grab a Thank you so much, folks. Have a great day. Thank you.